lot of questions for you, so many questions. And so if you see me looking to the side here, that's what I'm looking at or the questions that I have. However, oh. I find that the conversation naturally goes where it wants to go depending sure. on the guest. And so it's always exciting to just kind of like dive deep and just see where it takes us. So got it. So tell me everything about you. Take us to the beginning of who you are and, and how you discovered producing. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, you know, it's funny when I look back, I realize how lucky I am that I had such a strange uh, journey. Um, I had such a, it was such a roundabout way to get where I am. And um, I went to UC Santa Barbara, which was such an amazing experience. So it wasn't far from LA. Yeah. And when I was, I was going to graduate a little early and I didn't have anything to do. So I was like, all right, something possessed me to ride my bike to campus mm -hmm. and knock on that. Um, sorry, I'm just going to change the scout there. That's better. So now I know what I'm looking at. <laughs> um, Where's my cinematographer? Right. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to be a one-man band. This sucks. You know what? Oh, I, I am. I t it takes a village filmmaking for a reason. Uh, for exactly, a reason. Exactly. Yeah. So anyway, I. It's interesting because to this day, I do not know what possessed me. I had not studied film. I studied English and creative writing, which I loved, and I thought I was going to go to law school. Totally. You know, I think that year 75,000 kids applied to law school. It's yeah. crazy. And I just thought, oh, you know, th I, that's not it for me. So, again, I rode my bike onto campus and I knocked on Paul Lazarus's door. He's very, he was just this big, big, uh, big guy in the film department at Santa Barbara and kind of a famous guy. I'd never met him. He opened his office door and I said, I have this opportunity to get an internship in Los Angeles for a producer, will you give me four units and a grade? And he was like, sure, I just need his <laughs> name and number. So I was like, no problem. Ride my bike back home to my house in Santa Barbara and I call my mom. Do we know anyone in the film business? <laughs> and that was bad enough, but her answer was even better. Her answer was, well, we know so-and-so, but he does porn. And I was like, I don't care. <laughs> Give me his number. <laughs> Back then, uh, that's when mom said, okay. <laughs> and she said, here it is. And uh, I called him up and I said, I don't know if you remember me. Uh, we met through the North Valley Jewish Community Center. <laughs> I was like, Rachi, of course I remember you. He had like the thickest New York accent. Oh my God. Like, what, what are you character. doing? I was like, yeah. Uh, I know you produce movies. <laughs> I said, I need an internship. Can I work for you? He said, sure. <laughs> so next thing I know, Paul Lazarus, the head of the film department at UC Santa Barbara, is talking to this softcore porn producer. Did um, he know? Did he know that that's... That's I don't think that came up in conversation. Mm. Um, <laughs> the days before Google, right? Where you could yeah, just look totally. someone up real quick. Yeah, exactly. I Lucky. mean, <laughs> yeah, you know, you're right. That's a great point. I never yeah. thought about that. That because he could have Googled that? him and been like, "Are you sure, Rachel? Are this is a path yeah, exactly. Like, like, hmm, yeah. what are you going to learn here? Yeah. Uh, so uh, that was my first job. You know, obviously it was an internship and I used to drive back and forth from Santa Barbara to LA a couple times a week. Wow. And that's when I, believe it or not, softcore porn has development. They develop oh, scripts. Yeah. Um, you do coverage. And that's when I learned sort of the formula. So for every 20 minutes of programming, there are two teases and a sex scene. So you need to make sure you're hitting the marks. Um, so, so were you in like the development of script or were you also on set then watching the magic be executed? <laughs> so luckily, both. Um, so for my uh, spring trimester at UC Santa Barbara, I was just in the office doing coverage. And then that summer, I was able to be a PA um, for a movie and got to see it firsthand. And I actually um, was in the movie at one point. So it, it just gets better and better. Oh so, my gosh. 
I, Do you, is someone has someone optioned your life rights? Because <laughs> I feel like maybe I should get oh in on my that. God. Oh, geez. <laughs> um, so I, it's such a hilarious Hollywood story. So uh, such humble beginnings. So the movie was <laughs> filming in Arrowhead. And so I went up there and I was so terrified because, I mean, it was really like a real job, you know, and yeah. I was getting paid about $250 a week working 17 hours a day. Wow. So, you know. Making bank. Um, yeah, yeah. Getting rich. Oh, yeah, yeah, Living yeah. The totally. dream. I hit it. I hit it big. And, <laughs> but at one point I remember it was four o'clock in the morning, you know, you shoot a lot of nights. Um, and... <laughs> The, so we were doing, we were shooting one of the teases. So, and the actress was going to be in the shower, soaping herself and obviously naked. And right. I hear, Rachel, <laughs> and I was go running, yes, sir. <laughs> and they're like, get in the shower with Deborah. I was like, excuse me. <laughs> and so, because they wanted to, you know, look, there's still artistry happening. So the cinematographer or the electrician, like they still want things to look beautiful. <laughs> I mean, they're doing what they're doing, but like there's pride in work. Yeah. And they're like, we, the director really wanted this backlit. Well, you can't really put a light into a shower where there's water <laughs> and right. coming down on that. Not safely, no, you can't. <laughs> so they, they swap me out for the light. Oh. And they, they actually, sorry. They put me in there with the light and they turn off the water and they give me a spray bottle so I could spray the curtain. I was hidden behind a pony wall. She's right here <laughs> and I'm hidden and I'm spraying the curtain to give the beading effect while she's soaping herself. Wow. <laughs> it was awesome. So you so, were just doing like special effects in the shower scene. You weren't joining her as an actor all of a sudden. You know, unfortunately, no, it was, she, it was Deborah Shelton from, from Body Double, like the Brian De Palma movie, like wow. she's beautiful, but no, <laughs> sadly, it was just the beating effect. <laughs> just the beating. Oh man. That's okay. So how do you go from there? How long, I guess, how long were you in that industry before you took like, how step. do you go from there to Dallas Buyers Club? Yeah, like to becoming an Academy Award nominated producer. Like, you know, like it's a fascinating story, but like how, well, I guess how long were you in uh, that sect of the business? And, and what would you say were some of the biggest takeaways that you learned that yeah. like gave you the, the ammo to go into this, whatever was next for you? No, absolutely. It's a great question. And that's exactly the right question, you know, for any young people who might be listening to this, you know, to the trajectory was kind of basic, your basic stepping stones of continuing to work um, in that, you know, I, you know, whatever, C minus, whatever we used to call them, Skinamax and HBO mm -hmm. After Dark and that kind of thing and soft core. And, but working my way up, trying different jobs um, because basically it is, true with any industry. If you're smart, if you are working hard, if you are really like giving it your all and people see that, they just remember you because in production, it's a traveling band of gypsies. Yes. And everybody goes from one thing to the next to the next. And if you've stood out and made yourself stand out and worked really hard, then people will take your name with them as they move forward. And so I was lucky enough to slowly but surely the soft core porn transitioned <laughs> into, um, I mean, not that there's anything wrong with that. It's given me my, you know, gave me an education, a hands-on education. Yeah shooting film is shooting dude i film. think you get it where you can get it i think there's no shame absolutely you know and absolutely not at all and it's a great story and i it's you know awesome. i i one of my best friends who's at netflix whose name will you know be anonymous it was also her his first gig as a coordinator like <laughs> it's to, i mean it just who cares who cares and, yeah. um but so anyway, transitioning from that to like low budget action movies, which was amazing as an, a, a physical production education because we, I traveled to Hong Kong, Rome, lived in the Philippines while we made three movies. We basically 
were block shooting three movies. So to the point that you didn't know which script to bring to the set. We were doing three, traveled with all the actors for all three movies. We all like banded together. I was up to $400 a week, but now I was probably working 20 hours a day. It was insane. Is, were you independent though? Were you freelancing? Is that- Oh yeah, you, okay. totally. Um, but I met some like amazing people. It was such a great experience. And at one point we did 77 setups one day. And that's, so How? it's like guerrilla filmmaking that you don't really get to do in the same way because now everything is, you know, you just, a setup is totally different because, you know, things are, the technology is just totally different. So in any event, it was an amazing experience. And then from there, I transitioned to low budget indie. I guess I never transitioned out of it <laughs> fully, but I met this incredible producer, Steve Nicolaitis, and he was really my first mentor, he's a line producer, but he had done, he'd worked with John Singleton, he did mm. Boys in the Hood, worked oh. with Rob Reiner when Harry Met Sally and all of the Rob Reiner movies that you know are beloved. Um, he was really big and he was producing, so creative producing a small movie. It was Scott Kahn's first film. It was A Boy Called Hate. Mitch Marcus was the director and was out in Lancaster. Wow. And so I got a job. I guess I was um, like a second second at that point. And I, I don't, again, I don't know what possessed me. I walked up to Steve midway through the production and I said, I'm interested in producing if you ever need an assistant. I, you know, please think of me. So jump ahead. Um, I kind of was continuing down the physical production path and now I was like assistant coordinating or something. Yeah. And I got a job in Arizona, black and blue productions, Flagstaff, Arizona, filled up my entire car, moved to Arizona for this job. And within one week, it was pretty clear. I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> And they fired me. Oh, shit. And so I piled everything into my car to drive home. And I was like, you know, total failure. Like, I had just moved my entire life to so I'm like, <laughs> and the phone rings. We actually had a car. It was like the mid, mid 90s or something. My car phone rang, and it was Steve Nicolaitis. And he said, if you, you, you told me to call you, if I was ever looking for an, an assistant and I was like, yeah, I'm available. <laughs> it's like, I'm not mentioning that I just been fired. And that was really the beginning of looking at producing as a career potentially. And he taught me something that I'll never forget. He said, a producer is the cheerleader. You are the first to arrive. You are the last to leave. And, and they, and you set the tone. He always said that. And I always thought I never, and I think it's helped me. I never uh, separated the fact that he was a, a line producer. Like to me, a creative producer should be and can be the exact same thing because there, I, I don't think all producers look at it that way. I think producers have an interesting reputation of uh, doing things in, in a lot of different ways. So, um, but he was really awesome. That was a really fun experience. We did a movie, two movies at Sony. Um, and that was like, was like, holy crap. It was like on a studio lot. It was so different than the shit I had been doing. Yeah. And, Next level, right? It's like when yeah. you're like, oh, I've arrived. This is like real. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And then, you know, I got some, I got, did some interesting things like back in the days of the original Beverly Hills 90210. I did a couple, I produced a couple spots for Aaron Spelling. Nice. And, you know, it was when there were budgets, that was like really different. But I remember standing there on set for the promos for Beverly Hills 90210. I was shaking. I was terrified because the thing about our business is it's all shades of gray. There's no science. It's, there's no black and white, kind of like good news, bad news. Anyone can do it, but you have to like have enough belief in yourself, I guess, to project some sort of 
knowledge about something like it's a confidence yeah like a like a yeah. This 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 innate thing of like you don't have the answer because there is no answer really, but you're gonna find the answer. And if it's a challenge right. you haven't faced, you're gonna keep your cool and your calm, and everybody's gonna be panicking, and you're panicking on the inside. But you're like That's right. running into a closet, crying, and then making phone calls to figure out a solution. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. It's so true. You know, years and years and years later, as in a few years ago, I met Angelina Jolie, uh, who had just done Unbroken. Mm. And I had not, I, cause I recently directed a movie and I said to her, I'm thinking about, you know, directing this movie and she was so um, engaging and she totally was honest about the fact that like, yeah. You, and especially as a woman, you got to kind of get in there, project what you need people to see so before you're ready secure. Mm -hmm. And if, when you, when you need to go and cry, you need to do it privately. That's, um, and that's amazing. Angelina Jolie doesn't necessarily lead with that side, that vulnerable side of her personality. I think she's I know. definitely, you know, the, the, so the, vis, the, 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 what is the word I'm looking for? The image that we have of her is very much, she is Maleficent, yes. you know, she yes. is this like powerful being, but even yeah. Maleficent is like a very sensitive being. And yeah. so, um, that's it was, really it good to hear. It was very kind of her yeah. to share that with me anyways. So, um, from, from that opportunity for, with Steve Nicolaitis, which was amazing. Um, he also said something that I took with me and took it quite literally. He said, uh, no one can teach you how to produce. You have to produce to produce. And I, so we were on a hiatus and I went off and I produced my first movie for $90,000. It was a movie called Bury Me in Kern County. Um, Julian Nitzberg, um, wow. really talented. Mm -hmm. That he, he was the director. And um, I helped him make this movie, which went to South by Southwest and back when that was like a, a, a risque art tour festival, yeah, right? Not exactly. The back when there were $90,000 movies getting yeah, in. To festivals, and yes. I don't even think I understood what a big deal that was. I, yeah. had no I was just like, here I am at the Omni Hotel. Like, I don't even understand what's happening. I was, it's so interesting. I, I hope that I, my children will um, do as much leaping first as they do looking first, because I did a shit ton of leaping without looking. It definitely paid off, but like, holy shit, when I look back at that, I'm like, wow, I, there's a, there, you know what they say? Ignorance is bliss. I yeah. didn't know anything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I didn't know what I, I was doing. I always like to, say, oh, I, it's like, I, I didn't know it was impossible. So I just did it. It's kind of like what, what I say. Yeah. It's like, I didn't know I, it couldn't be done. So I just did right. it. And then yeah. I was like, oh, you're saying this normally isn't done. Right. I just found a way. And I think you, it's that gift of, of youth, right? That you can just kind of go straight into whatever, into the fire, into the lion's totally. den, and you just figure it out if you have that, like that innate thing inside you. But I do think that if you're always too cautious I don't know. I think that you're missing out on some of the thrilling aspects of life. As long as you don't die, like, I think yeah. it's, if you live to tell about it, you know, <laughs> I think it's like, awesome. how bad can it be? <laughs> how bad can it be? And I, and I, similar to you, I look back on some of like, I, I, tomorrow actually will be 14 years that I've been in LA, 10 of those producing. And I look back on some of the, the things I've done, situations I've been in, some of the like to your point, just the balls I had to just go up to someone and ask for something when I didn't know what I was doing. And it's, it's kind of like, who was that girl? But like all of those things have led me now to this point. And sometimes I, I, I wonder if people are too cautious, they, you know, they're always trying to get it right. And then in the always wanting to get it right, you're missing all the lessons and all the wrong ways to go about it. Um, totally. And I think there's so much value in that. Even things as simple as like sending a cold email to someone and getting it wrong, you know, like I think those are valuable. Accidental, accidentally or hitting reply all. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. I mean, there's all of those lessons. I think they're, they're painful, but they give you character. They give you that grit right. that you talk about. And they, and, and when you want to say, you know, when we want to talk about like the thin, thick, the thick skin sort of thing of Hollywood, it's like, 
Well, it just, it's not that it, it's not that you don't feel things. You just have a little bit more space between how much that can impact your soul or your exactly. person. Oh my you God. Know? A hundred percent. I yeah. have, the, I've had that exact feeling where like when I would mess up or somebody was torturing me, you know, because yeah. of whatever I, uh, you really t- would take it. The younger you are, the more you take it in and let it affect you. Oh, and I'm a Scorpio. So it was, <sighs> It's just so I'm a cancer. So yeah, like, so you I know. just reduced to a puddle of tears, you know, <laughs> so sensitive. So it's really been um, a pretty good ride. And, and actually my mentor after Steve was a really good um, Carrie Brokaw who had come from the, I mean, the God of independent film in terms of a uh, drugstore cowboy, the player shortcuts. Mm. Um, he went on to do closer with Mike Nichols and wow. and angels in america i mean kind of an iconic he actually i think he was responsible for sticking the print of rocky horror picture show under his arm for fox maybe and carrying it around to college towns and showing it to people and Mm. helping develop that cult following wow talk about a producer oh he's (laughs) he's amazing and i worked with him for four years as his assistant as his head of development as his uh vp of production and he was this elegant, non-screaming producer, old school, but the anti-screaming Weinstein mm. type. <clears throat> Carrie was just, he's an elegant, um, classy guy and um, very smart, incredible taste. So I feel like the gift I got from him was really my instinct for taste and material little bit of an independent bent. Um, But like, I remember the year I met him, both of us have the same favorite film, which was Jerry Maguire. That's a great movie. You know, because there's a, it's a big glossy movie with a fabulous director and one of the, and at the time, the biggest movie star in the world. Um, But the intimacy of that movie and the, oh, God. Well, the, the characters are so well developed and the, yeah. all the actors, like the entire cast, it's like that, yeah. it's like that lightning in a bottle you hope to totally. get, you know, yeah. with an experience. Um, I'm curious, you know, you've been in the business obviously a lot longer than me and with, since you brought up Harvey Weinstein, it sounds like from your experience, you've, you've had the good fortune of really finding the good men in the business who have like sh- helped and shaped you. Um, because I, yes, there's a lot of shady, terrible people in Hollywood, but I think there's also a lot of good, kind people who find their way and can get where they're going with integrity. And so do you find that, I, I get this impression, right, that the women who are 20, 30 years ahead of me who have found their place in the business carry this, this sense of like, you don't know what I had to do to get here, so I'm not going to help you because like you don't know the path that I've walked and the bullshit I've had to go through. So you figure it out there. There's a, there's a few women that I get that impression from. You don't seem to be one of them, but I'm curious if you have noticed since you started to where the industry is now, the way women are with each other in the business, like, especially in these positions of power, like has that changed? Were you impacted by that at all as you were coming up? That's such an important question during such an insane time in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I've definitely encountered, um, a lot of different kinds of women. Um, I have been screwed over, uh, by men in this business and I've been screwed over one of the worst times I've been screwed over was by a woman. Mm. Um, I, she's very much in the conversation now, so I'm not going to say who she is. Um, no need. We don't. We don't want that here. No, no. <laughs> and um, I don't believe in that. I don't believe that it's necessary. I don't believe it gets you anywhere good. Um, I think our job is to hand down as much knowledge and aid as we can um, to women coming up. Um, I, I 
think women are so complex. We're such complex beings Mm -hmm. that, and we have the same primal instincts as men. We're just not socialized the same way. Mm. So, you know, women aren't any better. They're not any kinder. They're just socialized differently and we're expected to behave differently. Mm. But there are plenty of absolutely cutthroat women out there. Um, And like, the other thing is, the good news is that being 15 years ahead of you in this business, or just rather having 15 years more behind me, I think that's that ugliness is a little more out of fashion. I think it's just it's just out of date and it's not in style to behave like a fucking asshole. Like I, I <laughs> yeah. with men or women, it's just anybody. It's, and, whatever and you identify is, you know, just don't be an asshole. Be no, whatever it's, you yeah, want. Yeah, nobody I don't think anybody's really interested in that anymore. Yeah. And that's a that's a really good thing. Yeah, yeah. Because it was part of the culture. Um that, and it was fascinating to sort of see but you know and maybe luckily for me I, I hadn't um, accomplished very much <laughs> as an independent producer it takes a so long to sort of like develop your get your stride hit your stride get some credits you know yeah it the, takes let, 10 years right Minimum. yeah let the work really speak for itself that um, I don't know I didn't really encounter anything too terrible yeah, because uh, it wasn't really a threat to anybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get that. That makes sense. So, yeah. so then catch me up to Dallas Buyers Club. Like, how does that enter your life? What was that experience of making that movie and then walking away from that, now becoming an Academy nominated producer? That's like three questions in one, actually. No, so I apologize. Yeah. But, like, I'm just, you know, I, I, I'm so curious once you have that accolade and that sort of button to your to your name what expectations the industry now has and what that means because everybody can look at that and think that's the end all be all goal right Um, but a lot of people I've spoken to the privilege of speaking to who either have been nominated or won an academy award like it's not always as uh, amazing as we on the outside think about so right please please yeah tell us more about that well, it's really, it's an amazing part of my life. It's definitely, you know, the, the jewel in my crown of, you know, my great honor so far in, you know, my career, um, having been able to be a part of it. it w- it's a bit of a story of sisterhood because Robbie Brenner, who's a fantastic female producer, she was running Relativity at the time and that was her baby. She mm-hmm. had been trying to make that movie. She had gone to college with Craig Borton in New York. They knew each other. He had written that. I think he had written the script 22 years before we shot the movie. Crazy. Wow. Um, it had been, in, it was in, finally in turnaround from Universal and she needed help. And she called and she said, you know, I know that you have always loved this. Do you want to help me produce this movie? Because I have a, a day job. And I was like, absolutely. She knew that I had a personal connection. My uncle had been on AZT and had died of AIDS. Um, Mm. And my dad had recently come out (laughs) at 70 years old. Wow. Um, We need a second episode just to get into that. Yeah, that's like a whole other thing. (laughs) And um, so, yeah, it meant it was really important to me um, Mm. because it was what my uncle had gone through was just so horrifying. And um, so, yeah, she invited me in. And obviously gave me an amazing gift to allow me to work on it with her. She is like a sister to me um, and an amazing producer. You know, look, the only sad part was that, you know, she had that day job that, you know, we couldn't be together physically the whole time. But yeah, um, and it was the hardest experience of my life. It, I was away for, so I was living in New York with my husband and my kids um and so we but we were shooting in louisiana so it was like a three-hour plane ride i went home every single weekend and tried to still be a mom it was so fucking brutal we had we had no money we did not have we basically had three and a half weeks of paid prep on the movie because our money kept falling apart 
and God bless Matthew McConaughey and Jean-Marc Vallée who were like, you're going down there, I'll meet you there, let's just go. And everyone banded together to figure out how to do it. Um, we had some very colorful people involved, some investors that were found uh, by Cassian Elways, who is a, a legend and has made 300 movies at this point. And um, people he had worked closely with like Holly Wiersma and um, Logan Levy, who was sort of newer to the business, but he helped bring money to the table. Mm -hmm. And um, and then these folks out of Texas ended up pulling through at the last minute, but like I was paying for the crew to eat on my credit card. Wow. Um, uh, we, had a, we had a wonderful line producer, Michael Sled, um, and his partner, Perry Creedon. Like, these are amazing people. Um, Jean-Marc had a great uh, crew that he brought down from, we had to figure out how to get them down from Montreal. Um, wow, what was, a puzzle. <laughs> it was such a puzzle, and it was excruciating. Yeah. Because the stress was really high, and... Um, there were some assholes in the bunch, like um, just, it was a complicated group of people, um, but the stress was high and everybody needs to point a finger. And mm -hmm. um, again, just like any other time, I felt like there were moments where I was like, oh my God, do I actually know what to do? And when you're, when you're now staring at 75 faces who are looking to you, um, yeah, I mean, I, it, was, um, it was hard to remain confident during that time. So how did you? What did you, how did you go inside yourself and find that stamina to go on and story. not throw in the towel? Two things, story. Um, I know story. And the only moments I trusted myself enough were ended up being the most important moments where mm -hmm. Jean-Marc just, just, fighting with him and begging him to listen to me so I could bring to the table the only thing I really know. Um, I'm a great cheerleader like I was taught. I love crew. They are the glue that holds it all together. And, and I'm very good with people. And so I'm, I'm good at propping people up when they need it. I am good at solving problems in the moment. Um, poor Jared Leto, who was, they were, Matthew and Jared were starving to death. And I remember this one moment where like someone came to me and said, Jared won't get in the van because the teamster won't turn the heat on because he's freezing. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I don't even want to tell you, but I was like, you tell that fat fucking <laughs> <laughs> guy he's gonna jack up that heat if he's sweating he can lose some weight go get a snuggie for jared <laughs> i was like <laughs> i was like this is not okay yeah, like yeah we have to be human beings to each other yeah like, you can't you know and it's not just because jared was the talent but it was because i hate that shit when it's like i'm i'm in this um I only work yeah. for these people. I'm only in this union, so I don't care what happens to you. Ugh, tell me about it. It's it's a collective, and it is all about compassion for your fellow being, whatever union hat. What all of those things, like you said, doesn't doesn't fucking matter. So, no, absolutely. And yeah. and look, there were times where you know these were big movie stars, Jennifer Garner, like they were doing this for shit money. Yeah. And but there were times that they had to be told no too. Like Jared runs an empire, and there were certain things that he wanted and needed, and wherever we could, that's my you know right. my other policy. Wherever you can, you say yes. To right. Crew to cast whoever. But when you have to say no, you have to like with conviction, the answer is no. Yep. And you not speak because if you speak first, you lose a little yeah. of war moments and you have to, people just have to know when you're serious. Yeah. Um, there was this amazing opportunity. I think he was invited when Obama, he was invited to the White House while we were shooting. And it was like in the middle of our schedule and Jean-Marc and I were like, well, when's he going to have that opportunity again? Let's just figure it out. Yeah. Like, hell yeah. Totally inconvenient. But like, there's a world out there. Right. The world doesn't stop because you're in the vortex yeah. of production. Like life yeah. goes on. Yeah, um, totally. But so, so then you survive this experience, obviously. And you guys create something that 
stands the test of time, right? No, yeah, One of no, those no. stories. Yeah. And you, it gets in an academy. I mean, you guys win, what, what, what does it say here in my, in my notes? How many? Well, six? Three. Three. Six nominations and you won three of the six. What was your life like after that high? And how did that change your career as a producer, if it did at all? Oh, it did. It did. And I, again, I'm like, I, I'm just, I'm so grateful. Um, it, I learned so much. I had such an amazing experience. Like once we found our rhythm, by the way, when we were shooting, yeah. there were some really glorious, amazing moments of camaraderie and, and just getting through it and just really ultimately being there to support Matthew and Jared and Jen and um, the crew uh, and certainly the director um, as difficult as I was because I you know you don't go through this if you don't want to get the <laughs> the best product and I yeah. love that Jean-Marc and I grew to really understand each other I don't even think at the time I understood what a fucking genius he is mm. and like an amazing director a brilliant editor Je and and Eve Belanger who mm. has gone on to just uh, photograph some incredible movies as well. Like these are brilliant artists. So, I mean, like the fact that I had that experience on top of it, I'm kind of still blown away. Um, <laughs> I, I still can't believe it happened. Um, but it was such a ride. Um, it like, like a fairy tale felt, felt like a princess at times. Um, I, it was so fun to go through it with my husband who had written Wolf of Wall Street that year. Yeah. He was nominated for um, for adapted screenplay, and uh, Terry and I had like it was magical, and I will never forget it. I can only hope one day to experience something like that again. the 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 biggest um, the, the the thing I could tell you, in terms of the aftermath, that it wasn't like, oh, you know, can you know you can do. <sighs> The, the compliment is to the movie. The compliment, producers are not <laughs> heralded. Oh, yeah. yeah. In any, you know, which is totally fine. But the conversation was so interesting. It'd be like, you'd walk into a room and it'd be like, congratulations on the movie. It's so amazing. We, can, we want to, to do that with our movie. Can, we'd love to talk to you about helping do what you did on this movie. And I, you have to laugh. It's like, you can't. That, that's, that was lightning in a bottle. Yeah. That was a perfect storm and of being the little engine that could, being down, not out for how six straight years I was involved in that. Yeah. One. And they, they it's, and it's like that thing where it's like, that. and it's like that thing where it's got like nothing to do with you, but it's got everything to do with you. Well, and you know and, what I mean? In a way, yeah. because it's like what you bring to the table as a producer is inherently only something you have but you can it can you can only create that magic when all the other players are also bringing that to the table oh, and you absolutely. can't control that at no. all so it's no. this interesting dichotomy that's that's interesting yeah yeah no i i just remember thinking like good luck with your project but like <laughs> establish your own uh, you know sort of yeah. um world for it because so, but, you can't yeah. emulate another experience and you just, so you didn't feel like, okay, well now everything I do, there's this, like, I have to have this yeah. Midas touch and it all has to be at this level that is recognized by the industry. You know, you didn't no. feel that sense of pressure. I did not. Um, mm -hmm. And I certainly have, I wasn't able to replicate that sense. Um, but it did, it gave me the confidence to be like, fuck it. I'm going to continue to work on things that I love. And that gave me a lot of power mm. for myself and gave me the power to walk into a room because even if I'm not going to be, there's only one Scott Rudin, there's only one whomever who like, you know, or Spielberg or, you know, whoever's hitting the home runs time after time. Right. And you, so I'm never going to be that. And I don't care but what I'm going to be is a person who walks into a room and people know I will not give up. And when I say I love something and I say that I'm committed to something, that I mean it. Um, I'm also extremely lucky. Um, I, I have a, a very brilliant and successful partner 
Right. Who, you know, we both are kind of committed to working on stuff that makes sense to us and for us. A lot of people need to take jobs because they have to take jobs. And yeah. you know, God bless there. That's um, that you get a lot of inspiration from that too. Mm-hmm. So, um, but it, I feel like my currency is not the nomination. My currency is my track record of, um, I've worked on movies that I, it took me 17 years to make the movie that I just directed. I would have been trying to produce it for all those years before another movie that William H. Macy directed, which is the wackiest crystal. Is that- yeah. Which is just yeah. like such a wacky, fun, fantastical movie, which I love, but like, yeah. I don't know how many five people saw it. I have no idea. <laughs> um, so you don't, don't equate, so you don't equate like, so then your definition of success is not necessarily tied to the result of the project itself. It sounds like it's about the journey of making that thing and okay. getting to create something cool that you feel proud of, that you love. And if one pe- one person sees it or a hundred million people see it, it do- has no bearings to what that project means to you. Would that be correct? I think that is correct. I think that's kind of a drag certainly because things have changed so much that people aren't really going to the theater. Yeah. Forget about the time we're in right now, but um, right. I think the cycles in this business make it really challenging to kind of plant your flag in that space. And so certainly I've transitioned a lot to television as well. Yeah. A lot of amazing stories as we know for the last 15 part in, uh, largely due in part to David Chase and my husband, <laughs> Terry, yeah. with The Sopranos, like just ushering in an era of television. Um, which is incredible. Yeah. Which is really, I mean, I just, I'm I mean, astounded. What, would, what was, what was like, if there was one hardest, ch- well, I'm like, well, I can't speak. <laughs> what was the, <laughs> if there was like one thing you could say, this was the biggest hurdle you had to overcome from going to being a feature director, fe- a feature producer, Am I having an aneurysm? Like, what is happening to my brain? <laughs> Great. I, I, you know, you're that's not all that matters. It's not about <laughs> what's in my brain. It's about how pretty I look. We all know. I'll this let is... you know if you start twitching. Yeah, please. Like, nobody's going to listen to my words anyway. Um, no, <laughs> my question is like, when you were making that transition from features to television, was there one major hurdle that you faced as a producer? Or did you find some like seamless into that world? I asked because I'm, I'm in that middle of that pivot myself. And I truly don't know as a non-writing producer I'm trying to figure out how I can dip my toe into that pond and and kind of play over there for a bit um no there's there was no one hurdle um I think again story um I came up with an idea and used you know, whatever cred I had, because it was before Dallas Buyers Club, to pitch it to HBO um, and sold it in the room. And, but it's like something I would open a vein for. Yeah. I think people just really want to be inspired. And And that's, and and you, this was just an idea and a pitch. You hadn't like found a writer and developed anything. You just said, I got to tell you this idea. I'm so passionate about it. And they heard it and they said, yes. And then you put all the other pieces together. I did. And ended up co-writing the pilot. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I think it's all the same. I think I, I operate from where I operate from. And it, so I don't think it, the medium doesn't seem to matter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Especially now, right? Because everything, it's like, I mean, you look at some of the, the, the shows on Netflix, it's like, it's not quite television anymore. It's like no. a nine hour movie, really. Yeah, totally. <laughs> you know? and, and yeah, everything has changed. Everything, everything has, changed. has changed. Yeah, exactly. So with all the changes that we're facing, what are you most looking forward to? Is there something that you think? I'm looking forward to investing in one of those lights because I realize, like, oh my God, I need to get, like, if I'm going to do Zooms. Yeah. I mean, we know that substance and, like, doesn't matter. It's all about how you look (laughs) on camera. That's truly what our industry is built on. And it's true. Like, we laugh about this, but it is 100% true. Like, Oh my God. I mean, it's horrific. Um, so other, I pop- That's why I put on makeup and did my hair. Oh, you know, know what? This I, is going to be on YouTube it. forever. Exactly. Okay. I'm going to find my light. Bill Macy yeah. always said, find your, find your light. Yeah. Um, it's because you got that overhead light on top of you. It's, know. you know, I know why I didn't think about this. It's, it's so, good. It I'm keeps so it sorry. real. No, do not apologize. I like um, you raw and real. 
like this is me. I'm I'm not a well lit person. Let's just call it a spade. <laughs> uh, what was the last question? <laughs> what was my question? I don't even remember now. You were talking <laughs> about very fun though. Um, uh, you were talking about television, getting into television. You saying, oh yeah, selling it in the room and the pitch. Oh, how? What? Okay, yep, there we go. How? What? With this news, we're sort of in the wild west of whatever is going to be next for our industry. I think we're going yeah. through with the music business one in the early two thousands. And so, if you have, if you have any spidey senses for like what's next and what are you most excited about as we enter this new unknown, COVID aside, of our business. Well, you know, what's so funny is that my answer is so unbelievably kind of boring and totally in line with everything we've been talking about. Um, in 2009, I read an article in Vanity Fair about LeBron James, um, him and his four best friends growing up in Akron, Ohio, between mm. the ages of 11 to 18 and how they stayed together played together uh, to go on to win a national championship. One of them just happened to, of course, to be turning out to be Superman. And right. <laughs> I was like bawling my head off. And I, Terry came over and he's like, what's wrong? I was like, eh, LeBron. And, uh, and he's like, what are you talking about? I was like, this article, this is the most amazing sports story I've ever read. And he's like, honey, if you're reading about it in Vanity Fair, someone else is making that movie. I'm like, fuck that, I'm making this movie. And um, we actually just after, so now I've been working on this movie, you can do the math for really 11 years. Time. Yeah, and uh, we just got a, a green light to, <gasps> we're gonna be doing the movie. Um, so yeah. Congrats, that's so exciting. Thank you, of course, in a COVID world, we don't, the, who yeah, knows I mean, what that means. Who knows, but it'll it'll happen. It's it'll just happen. Now. Yes, and, just a matter um, of time. I was just actually texting with the the coaches and the players, um, you know, and the thing that has been really wonderful is that in all this time, because, you know, uh, Maverick Carter and LeBron are obviously pr producing the movie with me mm -hmm. or uh, <laughs> allowing me to produce with them. Uh, <laughs> um, very, they're just brilliant guys and, and the great people that work at LeBron's company, which is called Spring Hill. But LeBron has become the face and voice of social justice in a way that is so awe-inspiring. Like I cannot believe, and that what he has given to Akron and his I Promise project and that school, like he, is, he puts his money where his mouth is yeah. every time. So like in addition to like having the goosebumps about the story about these boys, it's like Stand By Me, I basically like I'm in awe of LeBron as he has grown and gone through. Yeah, uses influence, and, uses influence to actually make a change in the world. It's yeah, wow. I, it, it's I really know. it's amazing. And you know, I'll, I'll just leave you with one last thing: that the best thing about independent film. I was saying this to so Bill Macy is one of my best friends, and his wife Felicity, two of the best people I've ever known. We do not have to talk about the college scandal. It is just a too, just a horribly misguided thing to be to try and help your child. Um, but two of the best people I know, and we we've always said that if independent film worked as a proper business model, <laughs> that it wouldn't take so long to get something made, and you would just meet somebody, you make your movie, and you move on. But like you actually end up with these lifelong relationships because this shit never happens. <laughs> so it like, takes so long, yeah. Five years later, 10 years later, you're going to each other's birthday parties. You are now um, seeing children be born. It's crazy. So like the downside um, has become an upside that some of the most important people in my life, LeBron is just from afar, I, I don't mean to You're say not besties that. and going to brunch with LeBron, is he that what you're saying? He probably would walk by me on the street. <laughs> like, yeah. But <laughs> the connection that we have yeah. to make this thing about his life is, is also a huge honor. So it's just hilarious that once again, something I loved, something I wouldn't give up on, like this is really like the message I want to leave behind for people. Like, fuck it, don't, don't give up. You know, if, if, if you don't have to, if you don't have to, to, to eat or to, you know, whatever, yeah. I, to, to live, but don't give up in your heart 
and um, make people believe, convince them that you are right. And um, so ironically, that, that's the thing I'm most looking forward to coming up. I, I, it's so interesting how this podcast for me, very selfishly has become like free therapy in ways and serendipitous because I find that, you know, sometimes it takes a long while to schedule things is all of the nuances of that. But I find that every time I get to talk to someone like yourself, there's always a message that is delivered like to me personally that I needed to hear. There's always a reminder. And, and honestly, oh this show has been a, such a driving force to keep me going to exactly that, to not give up because it is so hard. It is so demanding. It does require like being an independent producer does require all of your energy all the time and spinning all these plates. And sometimes you're like, what the fuck is the point of any of this? Like, am I just wasting my time? Am I, I don't have a 401k. Like, should I have got, like, I don't have a college degree. Like what the, like, how am I going to sustain this when everyone I talk to, no matter how successful they are, tell me no matter how high you climb kid, it's, it's doesn't ever, it never gets easier, you know? And I think I had this impression of like, well, when I get to have a first look deal, when I blah, 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 these things will all fall into place. And it seems like maybe they do for a while. Right. But then there's always, you're always in this pendulum and it's like, you can never stay in the middle. Like balance is literally not possible because gravity right. will always pull you in one direction. Right. And so everything you're saying is like hitting me on such a personal note because I just really needed to hear that yeah, today no, I, because it's well, and look, really hard. But look what you're doing. I mean, you're, you're, you're doing it. That's the other thing is, you know, it, so I think producing is so complicated because even when you're, we do it all day, every day, because it's about putting the puzzle pieces together yeah. and like, you know, and we do it every day often. No paid. Um, but you just have to keep going. And the other thing is you're totally accomplishing your goals bit by bit. Yeah. And, um, I wanted to just, um, also say that like, as women, um, we might get, you know, discounted at times, but like that shit is, it's bullshit. It's it totally, is bullshit. Absolutely. It is bullshit. And it's, I think it's, I don't know if men struggle with this, you know, but it's like, you have to have the stamina to convey that confidence, not just as a producer, but then as a woman as well. And it's right. like two different hats you have to wear to allow people to believe that you have that vision, that you are a leader and they should believe in your ideas and, and the yeah. creativity and all of that in March, you know, gathering people and saying, come on, like we're going somewhere cool. I don't know exactly how we're going to get there, but it'll be worth the journey. Like there'll right. be snacks, you know, like <laughs> that's kind of what it feels like sometimes. And you're like, I don't even know how to read a compass. Like right. how the fuck am I going to get there? So, I mean, and I, I think, you know, I, I want to wrap up on, on this question, which I ask because it's, it's been so prevalent in my own journey of the struggles and the down slumps of this business and the, the cost that it has emotionally on yeah. your soul. You know, there's this grief that is never talked about the loss of relationships, the loss of projects, the loss of time that you invest into something. And yes, there's always a lesson to be learned and something to be gleaned, but I have gone through a lot of depressions, you know, in, in my journey. And I think one of the frustrating things I encountered as in the past, like three, four years, I've reached levels of success that are visible. And I've been anointed by the business because I've had films and festivals and worked with celebrities and stuff like that. There is this perception that it's just easy and nobody has seen the years and years of bullshit and like heartbreak that you've had to go through to get to that point. And somehow, for some reason, I just always kept I considered leaving the business multiple times, but then I would come back, you know, I would like just always find a, a way to like reset and come back into it. And so I'm so fascinated how others do it. And people who, like you said, are 15 years ahead or have 15 right. years of more behind, like, have you experienced these ups and downs that have like really rocked you to your core and made you go like, okay, I don't know how to sustain this, especially as a mother, right. And juggling that dynamic. And how, how do you keep going? Asking for a friend, I'm the friend, like. <laughs> um, a hundred percent, uh, daily. Yeah. <laughs> no, cool, I, cool, cool, cool. Um, um, I've had times, uh, where I thought this is not going to be 
this is untenable. Like I, this can't go on. I can't feed myself or whatever. This was, you know, before having children. Then I thought like, oh, how am I going to do this? You know, being a mom. And I think it, uh, it does kind of go back to the, uh, the idea of what kind of example of a woman do I want to be for my children um, and, and my son, what, you know, and uh, so I have a daughter and a son, obviously. And um, <laughs> my dogs. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's never easy. And I definitely, the, sometimes the stress is so intense that you think this can't be healthy. This can't even be good. I'm taking years off my life. I know I am. And that you just, and I'm not, I don't meditate and I don't do yoga and I'm like, oh, I eat a bunch of crap. And um, <laughs> so I'm like horrible. I don't even, I don't even take care of myself. And <laughs> however, having children is almost a good inspiration in terms of like, well, I can't really give up because then I'm kind of showing them a person who gives up. And I'm showing my daughter that a woman cannot reach her goals mm -hmm. and that what do you do when it gets too hard? So I will say this to you. You were talking about the pendulum. Yeah. But I'll almost say to you, like, I think without the pendulum, aren't we sort of fucked also? Because you need to, you need the drive. You need the, the propulsion to go forward. And so if things were easy, like, you know, who wants to be a member of a club that would have them? So like, <laughs> you, you know, That's you have point. to, you have to keep going yeah. and um, you get surprised at the different parts of your life that show you, uh, that reinforce it in ways you never thought. So like yeah. as so fucking hard as it is to deal sometimes with having children and doing what I do for a living, um, it's also part of the inspiration itself, if that yeah. makes any sense at all. It makes total sense. I mean, as a woman without children, I, it makes as much sense as it can, but I, I've heard that theory from a lot of other women. And so it, it definitely ties into, yeah. So yeah. it's, it's, but, it's but with that said, if there's something else people want to do with their lives, I highly recommend <laughs> doing that. I just yeah. never found that thing that I wanted yeah. to do the way I want to do this. Yeah. Cause it is a shit business, but other it's, than that, it's great. <laughs> look, it's, it's uh, not for the faint of heart. It right. is like you said, like you said, it's, it's challenging. It's hard, but 95% of the time, the heart is worth it. You know, it's yeah. just that you, when you're in it, you don't know that like everything in life. And I think that's right. your point. Like there's so much drive required every day to keep these balls in the air that sometimes we don't have the time, the gift to stop and reflect on what we've done or how far we've come. And I think that's why your community and your tribe and your friends and your collaborators in the business, outside the business are so important to hold up a mirror to you and be like, yeah. Hey, like you're spiraling saying you want to be doing all these things and you don't think it's happening, but, but actually the, from where I'm sitting, this is all happening. Did you right. know? And you totally. go, Oh shit. Like you're right. Like <laughs> you're right. You know? So I think it, it is important to, to have people that hold, keep you accountable and keep you grounded. In, exactly. in that journey. And I think that's the only way you get to where you're going. And it's, you get there from a place of integrity. And like you said, there is no more space for assholes. And so it's like, I always preach on the pod. It's in your best interest to just be a good fucking person, no matter exactly. what job title you have or what you're doing today, yeah. because that's, that's right. the people we want around, you know? Absolutely. So, but this has been so, so lovely. Is there okay. anything else you'd like to say before I let you go? I just want to say thank you for doing what you're doing. It's so it's a great experience for me. It's a wonderful way to be reminded how lucky I am and how yeah. and how how much fun it can be. Um, you know, just it, well, I don't know. We're just we're lucky that we found ourselves in this position. And thank you so much for inviting me of to course. do it. Thank you so much for saying yes. Of course, this is awesome.